All right. The, uh, <clears throat> the goal of the message this morning, uh, like when we started the book of Matthew, I said our goal here in the book of Matthew is to try to look at Jesus with fresh eyes, to go through it slowly and see Jesus as he really is. Because oftentimes we have a, a caricature of who Jesus is. We make up a, an image of Jesus that isn't maybe entirely accurate or maybe we're too familiar with. And so Jesus bores us when what we have is God in the flesh uh, coming to earth to invade this planet to show us a totally different way of living, different way of thinking that's unnatural for, <clears throat> for fallen humanity. And uh, Jesus came in order to snatch souls right out of Satan's nasty paws. <coughs> and this is our Savior that came because he loves us. <coughs> I think I sang too much today. <coughs> can never sing too much. I think my voice gave out, gave out as I was singing just enough. <coughs> Last week's sermon was entitled, Better Love Than Mine, Knowing a Good Deal When I See It. And we were talking about how Christ loves us way more than we love him. Let's be honest, our love is miserable and sad and puny compared to this overwhelming love of Jesus Christ that went to the cross for us. And, and <clears throat> so many things knock us off stride. Well, I would be having a good day if the toast hadn't been burnt. And now I have the right to be miserable and to treat other people badly, uh, which is not a rational thought, but that's a sinful thought. Uh, so many things knock us off stride. Bad news, a bill... Uh, a bill in the mail, uh, somebody giving us a cold shoulder, or we think they, they are, but they've got something else on their mind. Uh, so many things knock us uh, away from Jesus, and meanwhile, he's just always loving us. When we give him the cold shoulder, when we think, I don't really have time for this. I don't really have time for God. I really don't, uh, I really don't think I want to go to Bible study today, or I don't want to go to church this morning. And meanwhile, the Savior of our souls, the King of the universe, is saying, come, come on, guys, let's get together. Let's do life together. <clears throat> so better love than mine, knowing a good deal when I see it. So, boy, I wish I loved God more. And, <clears throat> and I believe God is working on that and helping me with that. And, and uh, I'm, I think it's a good thing to be, you know, past halfway through my life and and still loving Jesus and walking with the Lord, that's probably a good thing. But I know a good deal when I see it. The guy, this guy up here, is crazy about me. I'm going to take that. I want to work on my side of the equation. But when somebody loves you that much, you do not turn your back on that. Today is part two of this sermon and the message entitled, A Bad Romance, God's One-Sided Love Affair with Humanity. And we've been saying this for a while now. But if you had a friend who pursued a gal the way God has pursued the human race, as she turns her back on him, ignores him, treats him poorly, gets his, gets his hopes up and said, I always love you, I always have time for you, and then doesn't spend time with him for weeks or months at end, you would say, guy, dude, you got to get over that. She is not good for you. She is not worth it. This is what we would say. And God says, no, 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 I got this. She is so worth it. I'm, I'm going to go get her. Well, what do you think you're going to do this time? I'm going to die for her. <laughs> no, guy, she is not good for you. Well, guess what? It's a bad romance. I'm so glad that God says, Dan, I'm going to love you despite yourself. Do not harbor the idea that God's getting a good deal. He is not getting a good deal. We're the ones getting the good deal. <clears throat> We're going to be taking communion today, and uh, we have very strict rules at our church for taking communion. You're not allowed to take communion unless you want to. Uh, uh, yes, you have to, in your heart, say, yeah, I want Jesus. Yeah, I, I know I need the cross. 
the, the, the elements of communion, we, what do we got here? We got bread. That symbolizes the body of Christ, right? We got the, the juice, the blood of Christ. You say, I am standing and I'm messed up. I know I'm messed up. I can be really, really nasty. I, I'm glad people don't see the way I talk sometimes, think sometimes. In all of these things, we're bringing before God and saying, I need the cross. I need the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to pay for my horrible, nasty, self-righteous, selfish, messed up, nasty self. So we're taking communion today, and if you know you're a sinner, and you know you need the cross, <clears throat> put your faith in Jesus and get it done. Now, if you don't think you're a sinner, you're not allowed to take communion. If you think you don't need Jesus, and you're not allowed to take communion. But if you know that you need a Savior, then take the communion. Humble yourself and accept this incredible gift as Jesus Christ lays down his very life for you and I. All right, uh, Matthew chapter 26. <clears throat> okay, Matthew chapter 26, and we look at the first five verses. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, remember he's talking about the end times. Uh, that was several chapters he was doing that. When Jesus finished saying all of these things, he said to his disciples, in this context, as you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. It's like saying, hey guys, as you know, in two days, I'm going in front of the firing squad. Guys, as you know, in two days, I'm, I'm going to the electric chair. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. So they wanted Jesus dead, but they didn't want to do it during this huge festival when people from all over the, the world, not just the Roman Empire, but there were people down from uh, Persia in, in India because Jewish traders had scattered, not trade tours, but people involved in trading merchandise. Uh, they were all over the, the world at that time. And so you'd have these people coming from everywhere, different languages, different cultures. They're Jewish, but maybe they lived someplace so long they didn't even uh, uh, speak Aramaic anymore. And so they're coming from all over the place. There's all these people converged in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And they said, we got to kill Jesus, but we don't want to do it when there's a lot of crowds in town. That would be a bad idea uh, because so many people think that he's a, a prophet. <clears throat> in the context of his imminent death, think about that. When you can put a date on it, I'm going to die, you know, next week, Tuesday or whatever. When you, in the context of his imminent death, Chris, uh, Christ speaks clearly about the end times. Do you think knowing that God is in control of eternity, God is in control of history, that God has a plan, that God is going to save his people, do you think that matters when you're facing death? <clears throat> I think Jesus was going to the cross with his eye on the prize. I have to go through the cross, but I'm going to get my people. He loves us enough to suffer in order to gain us. In a, a God... A, a Savior who would do that for me is a, is a God we can trust. Notice that Jesus Christ is incredibly resolute. He set his face, set his face like stone. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to the cross. Also notice he's in charge. The ruler said, we got to kill him. But not when all the people are in the city. Jesus said, in two days I'm going to die. That's not their plan. It's his plan. He is going so that when all of the Jewish world is gathered there, he is going to be crucified for everyone to see. Jesus is in control, not earthly rulers. And we have this incredible picture then. Jesus Christ, remember when John the Baptist saw Jesus on the shore and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God 
who takes away the sins of the world. Behold, the Lamb of God. Well, what, what does that mean, a Lamb of God? Well, what, what happened in Passover, remember? Each family had to get a lamb, a perfect lamb, and they had to kill it. They had to take its blood and paint it over their door frame. So the wrath of God in, in Egypt would pass over them. Jesus now, as the Lamb of God, is going to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, the Lamb of God, celebrating this time, and he is going to be the Lamb for all of us so that by taking his blood and applying it to our hearts, the wrath of God will pass over us. Also note this contrast. The people planning to kill Jesus were among the people that Jesus was planning to die for. You ever think about that? Jesus Christ wants to die for me, and I am tired of him in my life. Or I'm tired of him thinking he can tell me what to do, or I'm tired of this or that, or, or I'm just tired of religion or whatever. Jesus Christ willing to die for the people that wanted to get him out of the picture. Okay, let's continue on now. Chapter 6. 26, 6. <clears throat> While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, and I just, we talked about this last week, I just love that. A Jewish person would be ceremonially unclean to be near a leper. They would not touch a leper. They would not be in the home of a leper. Jesus, God comes down. Can you imagine being Simon? All this time, everybody, when you're on the streets, everybody clears away. Everybody gets away from you. Nobody wants to be near you. God comes down and comes into your home. Simon knew he was loved like never before. This is Jesus. Jesus is a wonderful Savior. And by the way, this book is just so offensive to everybody. It, it was offensive to Jewish people because there's one God and Jesus is God and in lepers, you ceremony unclean, and God comes down, he's with the leper. It's, it's, it's offensive to, Jew, to Greeks because Jesus said, I came to talk to the Jews. I didn't mean to come to the, talk to the dogs. You know, so who, who was this written for? And yet it rocked the world. It changed the world. So here Jesus is at the house of Simon the leper, a little toss-out verse there. A woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When his beloved disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. I put that beloved part in there. That was a little bit of sarcasm. His disciples, his inner group, the men he trusted most, he had been traveling with these guys for several years at this time. And she blesses the Savior of the world, and they are ticked off about it. They're, they're churned up, and they're, they're morally outraged. They're wrong, but they've got their gander up, whatever a gander is. I just realized I don't know what that means. Is that a goose getting angry or something? Uh, this dander, thank you. It's like stuff you get in your hair, I guess. Uh, this perfume, now that we've got that straightened out, Yeah. So the disciples are angry, and they said this perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. So it's always best when you can mask your uh, self-righteous anger in religion and make it look like, well, we just care about poor people. Uh, aware of what they're thinking, because he's Jesus, aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? Isn't it funny he didn't take offense for himself? took offense for her. Here she did this great act, pouring out her wealth on Jesus, and they're critical of it. He says, why are you bothering her? You boneheads? Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. <coughs> when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I tell you, Wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, which again, this book 
the book of Matthew is written very early, very, very early in the history of the church. The New Testament finished before uh, the, the first century was finished, most probably. And Jesus is already saying, yeah, this is going to go everywhere. I've got 12 disciples, 11 really, and you guys are cowardly and you're going to scatter, but this message is going to go all over the world. I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. The disciples uh, at this time in their lives considered the woman's gift a waste. Now, I don't think they thought that way later. Matthew wrote this. Remember, he was one of the guys saying, why are we wasting? He's the guy who also recorded it. Isn't that beautiful that we read the Gospel of Matthew and the disciples don't come off that great? Who wrote it? Discipled Matthew. Because he understands grace now. And he didn't, he didn't have to be the big deal. Other people wrote about Jesus, and he was the center. And they wrote about their own failings and misgivings and doubts and, and failures. Because they understood it's all about the king. It's not about them. And Matthew, by showing their lack of faith and their immaturity, uh, <clears throat> that saves us from this idea that uh, the disciples are these incredible angelic-like beings. Only God is God. The disciples, uh, those that stuck with Jesus, they, guess what? They went on to die for their faith in Jesus, and they changed the world. God used them in mighty ways. But it was a rough process. It was a rough process. How would you like to be a discipler and have these guys as your guys? He must have felt like he failed. I mean, he knew the future, but as a failure, as a disciple, to have the people that you invested your life in most are betraying you, letting you down at every turn. So the disciples are ticked off at this woman. Uh, listen, wealth lavished on God is never a waste unless you think it's a waste. And then it's automatically a waste. So if, if you are writing out a check for, to, for some ministry like we did for Samaritan's Purse, and you are saying, man, I hate doing this. This is just a waste. Guess what? It's a waste because not only do you lose your money, you're not going to get blessed either. It's a double whammy. But if you can give out of your love and out of your freedom, say, I just love to be able to support God's work. And, 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 and you're always sitting in that check. Wealth lavished on God is never a waste. As we saw last week, the disciples, you know, they were still arguing who was the greatest. Now, I don't think they stood there and said, I am greater than you. Well, well, heck no, I'm a lot greater than you. And then another one comes up and says, but I am the greatest of all. You know what they were doing? What, what do religious people do? I had a ministry today and five people were saved. Awesome, good job, brother. Um, you, maybe someday you can be like me. I had uh, 45 people. You know, they're arguing who's the greatest. They're not saying I'm greater. They're using religion to make themselves look better than other people. So, so right here at the end, his disciples are letting him down everywhere he looks. But Jesus wasn't a lousy discipler, but it did kind of take a death and a resurrection to get people on track. And then the Holy Spirit coming. Uh, as we saw this last week, they're arguing they're begrudging the waste of the perfume poured out on him. One of his disciples is actually going to betray him to death for a bag of coins. That's bad. When your buddy takes a check to get you thrown in jail, you kind of feel let down. I think the average person is going to feel hurt at that point. It gets worse. He lets him down, and it's dark out, and he's leading this angry mob of people and he says, the guy that I kiss on the cheek, because that's how they would welcome in that culture, he's the guy, go get him. And so Judas goes up and gives Jesus a kiss on the cheek. Jesus looks at him and says, are you going to actually betray me with a kiss? I think that was a miserable time for Jesus. I wonder what it would translate like for us to betray Jesus with a kiss. Praise Jesus, hallelujah, I love you, Jesus. Urgh, and I can't stand the people around me. Jesus said, are you going to betray me like that? using the same lips to praise God and cut down other people? How does that work? It don't. 
The people he loves, including the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, the Herodians, these are the people that want him dead. You know, a lot of people can dislike people. You can, you can be disliked fairly easy. Very few people have whole crowds of people wanting them dead. Jesus was only motivated by love. He came for love. He loved. He, ex, he, he, he held out the hand of friendship. He wanted to bring forgiveness and peace, and people wanted him dead. Well, that's not fair. You're right. Life isn't fair. Get over it. Judas lied to him, betrayed him with a kiss. Peter, the rock, Jesus said, you're going to be the rock, you know. <clears throat> Peter and the others are going to boast about how much they love him. Christians get together. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Oh, how we love you, Jesus. Boasting, bragging about how much they love, but not loving the people that he is going to die for. Talking and boasting about their dependability. And then they can't even stay up and pray with him for one hour. When he is most, at his most heart-wrenching moment, when he wants the support of his friends, how do I know he wants, am I reading too much in? Because he comes to him and says, can't you even stay awake and pray with me at this time for one hour? Just after they boasted about their love and dependability, when he's most desperate, they can't pray with him. And when he's arrested, they scatter. Whoosh, they disappear. Go into hiding. And then Peter, his main man that he invested the most into, denies knowing him. In Kurtz, it also, he says, I do not know this man. Three times he denied knowing Jesus. Okay, remember the name of the title is A Bad Romance, Romance God's One-Sided Love Affair with Humanity. That's why I'm more comfortable singing about God's amazing love than our love. Now, we love Jesus, right? Yeah, if I say, who loves Jesus, everybody's going to raise their hand. We love Jesus, but God's getting a bad deal. But he knows the people we will become, and he's going to complete the work he started in us, and one day we're going to love him the way we should. Jesus' love never falters. Well, I can't love this person because they let me down. You said, would you like to explain that to me? I can't love this person because they hurt my feelings. Yeah. You know, if you stopped loving, they wouldn't hurt your feelings anymore. But if you want to love, it's going to hurt sometimes. And he kind of goes like this and you see the hole in the hand. It's going to hurt sometimes. See, that was so you could see the hole, you know. How can we say, I hate those kinds of people. I, can't, I wish those kind of people would just all disappear. But Jesus said, wait a second. You know I died for them, right? Who are you? I love that person. Get away from them. They're mine. Jesus' love never falters. Everybody can go to heaven if they will come to Jesus and just say, I need some help here. Please forgive me. I want to say, yeah, I've been waiting for you. Come on. I died to bust open the doors. It's wide open. Everybody can come. Come on. Come on. And we're going to be the, the little guards and say, oh, this person's good enough. Don't want this person in my community. Don't want this person in my church. Don't want people like that here. Jesus, come, come, come on. You know, it's tough to be a parent. <laughs> It's really tough to parent Dan Wolf. It ain't so easy to parent you guys either, I'm thinking. Jesus, though, his love doesn't falter. What did I tell you last week? If there's one thing you've got to remember, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. In the face of failure and people letting him down, we're building this momentum to the cross, and all around Jesus, people are failing him and letting him down. And still he's resolute. I'm going to die for these people. Well, the Bible says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And I think, okay, I'm going to believe that. 
because he went to the cross for me. If Jesus was willing to die for me when I wasn't a Christian yet, now that I'm his child, I don't think he's let me go. I do not believe he will ever let me go. He would have to deny his own character to let me go, and that's not going to happen. His love is not based upon us loving him properly in return. His love is patient. His love is kind. His love is unending. And he can forgive again and again and again and again and again. Brothers and sisters, when we uh, blow it, when we mess up, when you treat your wife the way you should not treat your wife, when you treat your husband inappropriately, when, when, when you find yourself just caught up and all you're thinking about is materialism and the things you can get out of life, and you're saying, whoa, what am I doing? It just hits you. Sometimes we feel so ashamed of ourselves, we don't even want to pray. Oh, I just repented of this last week. I just repented of this this morning. I've got to repent of this lust again this afternoon. I, all of these trials and temptations that come, you feel like, I don't want to talk to God about this again. Guess what? We talk, listen. Listen, that's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants us to repent again and again and again because God forgives again and again and again. The blood of Jesus Christ covers all our sins, and if we don't repent, we're out of step with the Holy Spirit. We're out of step with Jesus Christ. If we don't repent, if we don't confess, I blew it, I'm wrong, you're right, God, then spiritually we're all messed up. And that's when you get difficult to be around, you get angry, you get feisty, and, and you get pouty, and, and depressed, and, and our relationships go down, our relationship with God goes down, and the remedy is repenting and believing that grace. Just, it's, when it's hot, when it's sweaty, just, ooh, take a bath, and just plop down to that Lipton iced tea, and, and you just, let, let grace cover you, completely. Jesus, listen to this, he's willing to wait for us to grow up. And we're going to get there. The Bible says he started a good work in us. He's not going to finish until he completes the job. You're, you're going to be the person that God intended you to be. I'm going to finally be who Dan Wolf is supposed to be when I stand before him in, in the heavenly kingdom. But you know, in the midst of all this failure, there's a bright spot, there's a bright light. This woman who pours out her expensive perfume, it's her treasure. She takes her, her most valued treasure and just pours it on Jesus. She's acting out of simple gratitude and appreciation. The disciples had face time with Jesus. The disciples spent time with Jesus. The disciples had the better, deeper theology. They could explain all of the difficult theology to this woman. She didn't have their training. She didn't have their time with Jesus. All she had was adoration. This man is good. He's holy. He's wonderful. And I'm going to give him the best that I have. Jesus commends her for it. Uh, brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ did not die on the cross so we could set up lecture halls, so we could be so... Brilliant. God does not need more big brain intellectuals preening to see who is most profound. But he praises this woman's act of love. We need a lot more love. We need a lot more extravagant blessing of the Lord. We want to just love Jesus and pour our best out before Jesus. Give Jesus our best. So there's a bright spot. We don't need to, to know everything in order to say, Jesus deserves everything I have. He deserves my best. I'm going to give it to him. And Jesus praises her. Let's look now from, from 26, 14. 14 through, 14 through 19. Then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest. So here's Jesus. He's loving. He's loving. This woman blesses him, and she says she's going to be remembered because of her good deed. And Judas thinks, well, you know what? I'm going to be remembered too. And so he takes off 
to do something different than the woman did. She gave her best. He's going to take. Then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, hey, uh, what would you give me if I deliver Jesus to you, if I betray my best friend, the one who loves me the most? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. And he laughed an evil laugh. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity. So he's looking, he's plotting for a chance to hand Jesus over. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations to eat the Passover? He replied, go to the city of, to a certain man. In Greek, when you say a certain guy, that means everybody knew who they were talking about. Jesus, this is a friend of Jesus. The disciples knew who he was talking about. The teacher says, my appointed time is near. My time, he's talking about the cross, right, is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. I'm going to die, and I'm going to celebrate Passover with my disciples, the people I love. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When, everyone, when, when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table at 12, and while they were eating, he said, you know, truly, I tell you, one of you guys, guys is going to betray me. They were very sad. And they began to say to him one after another, Surely not I, Lord, surely not I. <clears throat> Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just uh, as it is written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus said, You have said so. We asked last week about Judas. What's my price? Money, relaxation, popularity. What do I trade Jesus in for? Well, I don't want to talk about Jesus because I want people to think I'm cool or intellectual. Or I don't want to give my money because I really want a PlayStation 27 or whatever they're at now. Uh, I, I don't want, what, what is my price where I think, well, I want this more than I want to serve Jesus? And then we see Jesus coming to, well, let's just keep reading there, okay? Uh, you said, so verse 26, going to go all the way to 30. While they were eating, Jesus took bread when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when they had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. I like that last part. It's just what they sang together. Isn't that cool? Not only we sing with God, God came and they were singing with God. God in flesh. Jesus is singing together with his disciples. The same disciples that had just said, surely not I, surely not I. I would never betray you. Well, guess what? Every single sin is a betrayal. Every time I sin, how's this for a horrible, scary thought? It's one more sin that gets dropped on Jesus Christ on the cross. So as we're going forward, more weight gets added to the cross. Well, from his perspective, he took it all on him all at once. But as we allow a nasty, bitter, angry thought, unforgiveness, hard-heartedness, greed, as we allow that to fester in our souls, we're adding to the weight that he experienced on the cross. Surely not I. I would never betray you. Yeah. I want us to take a moment right now, and we're, we've still got more of the message, but we're going to do communion now. I want you to take a moment to think about what's going on in our own hearts. And I'd like the deacons to come up, please, at this time, pass out the elements of communion, Jerry and Aaron. Surely not I, Lord. How have we, in our thoughts and our deeds, failed to live up to our calling in Jesus Christ? What are the things that we've said and done that we want to say, God, thank you for that cross for this morning? I want to invite each one of us right now to just individually accept the grace that God has given us, to remember how good, how good God is, God loves you, and accept the, uh, 
the uh, bread and the juice. Please think about that. Don't take it, we'll take it together, okay? We'll take it all together today. You remember when Christ talked about uh, the sheep and the goats and the wheat and the tares? Remember those stories? Uh, at the end time, at the time of judgment, please listen, at the time of judgment, God's going to determine who truly believes in him and who doesn't. Those who have truly come to him and want to be a part of what he's about. Because Jesus is not going to turn away anybody who wants to be with him. Those who have truly come to Jesus, they get to be with him for eternity. And those that were using religion to build themselves up, or, or those who didn't want any part about God, or were sitting in the seat of mockers, and, or those who were just too busy, or, or whatever reason, life got in the way, and they just, they will be separated out for eternal separation from holy God. You know when that separation happens? It happens at judgment. That's not our job to separate now. I want to ask you a question. Everybody listen. Did Jesus offer communion to Judas? The answer is yes. Whether Jesus, Judas believed or not, and we know he didn't, that was between him and God, and he would bring judgment upon himself. But Jesus offered his grace to everyone. It's that way with communion, and it's that way with baptism. Everybody who comes and confesses the Lord and comes to Jesus is offered communion, is offered baptism. God, at the end of the age, se separates out who truly believes and who doesn't. And that's his job. We don't turn people away from communion. We don't turn people away from baptism who come and say, I believe, I want to be part of what God's people are doing. Everybody understand the way our church does it? Can I hear him? Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. So this is for everybody who wants it. You're your own gatekeeper. Thank you, brother. So this is symbolic. This is symbolic then of the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, of the body of Jesus Christ. He instituted this. Isn't that interesting? He's having this last meal with the people he loves most, and he says, Here, I'm going to give you something, and not only for you guys, I want all future Christians. This is what Christians are going to do, my followers, to remember what I've done for them. Our unity, our community, our communion is around Jesus Christ. Not shared interests, not because we're all the same age, not because we all like the same things, but because of the, what Jesus Christ did for us. So here we go. This is the body of Jesus. We have to ingest Jesus. We need to bring Jesus in. We need to have Jesus in our lives. Because without Jesus, without the cross, there is no forgiveness. There is no heaven. There's no peace. There's no joy. Let's take, let's remember what Jesus has done. Let's take it into our lives and say, think it in your hearts. Jesus suffered because I'm nasty. Can you think that? Can we all think that? And he loves me. Can we really all think that? Jesus loves you. Do you know it? Amen. Man, did Jesus loves you. Amen? Amen. Jesus loves us in our nastiness. Let's say, thank you, Jesus. Then Jesus took a cup and said, this is my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. He knew what he was doing was more for those people in that room with him. 
He's pouring out his blood for many. Why? For the forgiveness of sins. I want you to lift your cup right now. This is a good thing, what Jesus has done for us. This is a good thing because we get to be with him. Because of his goodness, we get to be with him. Not because of our goodness. Why don't you think a moment? This is the first sin that comes to mind. What's the first sin that you're thinking of that you've done? Have you been ornery, nasty, self-righteous? Maybe you lust, maybe greed, maybe bitterness? Come on, you're not wimpy. You can all hold your cup up. I want you to think in your heart, this blood was for that sin. Thank you, Jesus. What an incredible God we have. What an amazing God we have. Don't spoil it with superficial, human-made religion. God is worthy of what? Everything. All through the Old Testament, we saw God in the classic role of this romantic pursuer. God pursuing. You know that image of the white horse? Guess what? Jesus is coming of a white horse at the end. He's coming to take his people away. All through the Bible, we see God is the classic romantic pursuer. He's trying to woo and win the affections of his people, of a disinterested and fickle humanity. And we'd see, like in the cycle of judges, people coming, the culture coming to God and then turning away from God, and then coming to God and turning away from God. And even in our own lives, there's ups and downs, and God is pursuing us and trying to get our attention and saying, I'm all you need, I'm everything, come to me. And it almost seems sad at times when we see the children of Israel reject him again and again and turn their backs on him, and they actually chase after foreign gods with disgusting, wicked rituals, turning their back on the, the living God who really cares, who's actually there. And again, we see all the while God is pining. You know that word pining? Yearning, just ooh, waiting for the day. And we called it God someday. All throughout the Old Testament, we see God saying, someday you're going to be my people and I'm going to be your God and the world is going to be right. And God is looking forward to that time. <coughs> and then we see in the New Testament, not only is, is God sending his prophets to tell about him, God puts on flesh, born in a manger in humble circumstances, God coming to be alongside of us, God invading our planet with his love on a rescue mission. And for the most part, the world ignores him and Christians yawn because they've heard the story before. And people abused him, the people he made. He made them. He made them special. And he saw them nursing at their mother's breast. He saw them when they were picked on. He saw them when they were going through all their, their fears and worries and concerns. And he gets there. He's been loving them since before they were born. And they spit on him. They slap him. They beat him. The people that did want him wanted him only for what they could get. Free meal. All right, I'll do the religion thing. What's in it for me? What am I going to get? Yet, he was determined to win us with his love. His goal was not just to capture us because God could capture us with just a snap, with just a thought. You're all mine. Instead, it would be easy for the king of the universe to do whatever he wants. Instead, God's goal from the beginning has been to capture our reluctant hearts so that we would love him in response to his love because God thought all of creation was worth creating a place where a love relationship could happen. And so we have this epic story of a great king, a great king, the greatest king coming down to poverty, a king who sets, he takes off his royal robe. You know, he, he, he gets scruffy. He takes off his crown. He leaves the palace and he goes down to the slum because there's a gal that down there that's just captured his heart. And so we have God, this epic love story, God setting aside his glory, going to a place of misery, a dirty place, a place of death, to chase the object of his affections. And she doesn't see his value at first because she's so messed up and hardened by her sin and the world's sin she can't see a good deal when she sees it. She can't see it. 
but he keeps pursuing. And not until he finally proves his love by dying for her, right after she rejects him in incredibly selfish fashion, not until he finally dies uh, does she begin to see his love. But that's not how the story ends. The king rises from the dead, proving in this love story, just like in the great Hollywood romances, the great love stories, when you think everything's lost, it comes right back. He rises from the dead, proving that true love is stronger than the grave. And he reaches out to grab a hold of his bride with his nail-scarred hands. And his bride suddenly now sees his glory and the depth of his commitment and his love. And by contrast, she sees her own squalor, her own spiritual poverty that she had been living in. But even then, she knows she's unworthy. She knows she's unworthy. But instead of turning away, she's so captivated by the love in her eyes. She knows she does not deserve to be with this God, but when he reaches down and says, you were made for something better than this, let me take you away from this, she's so lost in the warmth of his eyes that she tremblingly says, yes, and this is the bride of Christ, and this is the way the story goes, God's love story. But not for everyone. The story doesn't end and happily ever after for those who persist in rejecting the great king's advances. And think about this, who would rather live in a world, in a universe where the greatest love story ever told is not true. Would rather live in a universe where love is just biology, collisions of molecules. Where we're here by chance, when we die and the, universe, and the earth dies and rolls on and rolls on and rolls on in the blackness of space, nothing we ever do will matter one bit. And, and space doesn't care. Just before the Bible ends, God has this to say to us in Revelation twenty two seventeen: The Spirit and the Bride... So God and his bride say, the bride is the church, say, come, Jesus, let the one who hears say, come, and then let the one who is thirsty, thirsty for righteousness, thirsty for God, thirsty for goodness, you've been captured by goodness, and you believe there is good, there is right and wrong, there is a better way, and I want it. Let that person say, come, let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of eternal life. So what's your wish? What do you hope is true? Dear Lord God, help us to hold on to you and never let go. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.